Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 81 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. It's trivia time. When did the fighting of the American War for Independence come to an end? Did you answer Yorktown? In school, we learned that the fighting of the war came to an end at Yorktown. But today, Don Glickstein, a former journalist and author of After Yorktown, The Final Struggle for American Independence, is going to take us on a whirlwind tour of all the fighting that took place after October 1781. During our global tour of the American War for Independence, Don reveals details about the Battle of Yorktown, Fighting that took place in southern, northern, and western North America, the Caribbean, Mediterranean, and India, and when the war actually ended, and what happened when it came to an end. But first, did you know that there's an online community of Ben Franklin's World listeners? It's called the Ben Franklin's World Community, and it's hosted on Facebook. The community is where we gather to discuss life, current events, and of course, history. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of discussion about what we discover in this episode in the community later this week. It's free to join the Ben Franklin's World community. All you have to do is visit BenFranklin'sWorld.com and click on the orange Join Now button on the homepage sidebar or text BF World 233444. Are you ready to embark on a tour of the last days of the American War for Independence? Let's go meet our guest author. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is a native of Schenectady, New York, and a graduate of the University of Massachusetts. He worked as a journalist for 10 years before becoming the public information officer for the nation's largest healthcare cooperative. Today, he joins us to discuss his book, After Yorktown, The Final Struggle for American Independence. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Don Glickstein. Well, hi, Liz. Glad to be here. If we think back to what we learned about the American Revolution in school, we might recall that the war ended on October 19, 1781, with the surrender of Charles Earl Cornwallis at the Battle of Yorktown. But it's likely that many of the other facts about that battle remain a bit hazy. Don, would you sharpen our memories by providing us with a brief overview of Yorktown and Cornwallis's surrender? I sure will, but first I need to talk about the names I'm going to call some of these folks. For example, I don't use the terms patriots or Americans to refer to Washington and other founders because loyalists and Native Americans were just as patriotic in their own way and certainly just as American. And I think that using the terms like patriots and Americans without any other modifiers gets us into the trap of arrogance and being a journalist by profession. I like to separate fact from language that's a bit biased. Let's go on to Yorktown. Our common perception of Yorktown is that it was this great American victory by George Washington. But in reality, although Washington was the commander, it really was a French victory, and it was made possible by a French strategy. There were two French fleets involved. There were French siege engineers, French artillery that just pounded the British. It actually was fought largely by French soldiers and Marines and sailors. They outnumbered their American allies for to one. The whole campaign was set up by a French expatriate, who I'm sure you've heard of, the Marquis de Lafayette. He commanded a small rebel force that had shadowed Cornwallis throughout that summer. During the siege of Yorktown, Whig troops, Whig is what the American rebels called themselves, Whig troops captured one of two key British fortifications, but the French captured the other one. Yorktown really was a victory financed by French money that paid arms clothed and propped up the Whigs. And I might add that it was also French diplomacy that ordered the French general to publicly defer to Washington without overtly ceding him any authority. So Yorktown really is one thing in American mythology, and the facts were quite different. Bill would like to know how Americans living through the War for Independence understood Yorktown and its significance. Did they view Yorktown as the end of the war, or was Cornwallis' surrender just merely a bit of good news? 
It really depended on your perspective. The British Prime Minister, Lord North, thought it meant the war was over. But King George thought that Yorktown was just a setback, and he was not about to preside over the dissolution of the British Empire. The British military thought that Yorktown meant that they should change their strategy, and the new strategy would be defeat the rebels' allies first, and defeat them around the world, and then they can focus again on North America and the rebels. Washington certainly thought Yorktown was a wonderful victory, but he was prepared to continue the fighting. And when the French fleet sailed away from Yorktown, he was just incredibly frustrated that he hadn't persuaded them to help him take Charlestown, South Carolina, or even New York City. So Washington went back to the drawing boards and started planning his 1782 campaign. One of his his biggest concerns was that civilians and the rebel governments not become complacent. And in fact, his worries were not unjustified. He had lots of problems, as he always did, with complacency among the civilian population. So, Don, why do we learn that the American War for Independence ended at Yorktown when fighting continued into 1783? Yorktown was the last major victory on North America, and Americans tend to look at the world through American eyes. And once the British were soundly defeated here and there were no major battles in North America, why bother? Why care about what was happening around the world? Why care about our allies? We talk about some of the frontier battles and some of the battles in the South, but mostly Americans look at the world through rose-colored glasses, through the eyes of victors. And, you know, who wants to talk about more fighting and more suffering? Isn't it nicer to have a package neatly wrapped up? And after Yorktown, Don covers post-Yorktown fighting in six different regions. The South, the Frontier, the Caribbean, the High Seas, the Mediterranean, and India. Let's start our exploration of these regions with the South. Don, would you tell us about post-Yorktown fighting in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia? The British, after Yorktown, still controlled Wilmington, North Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia, and most important town in the South, Charlestown, South Carolina. Now, I say Charlestown town because it didn't become Charles Tun until after the war. The South had many, many loyalists, and this war in the South, it degenerated into this utterly brutal, savage civil war. Neighbors killing neighbors. They torched each other's houses. They murdered unarmed men in front of their families. The brutality was very much like that Mel Gibson movie, The Patriot, except that Gibson's movie inaccurately showed that only the loyalists and the British were conducting atrocities. In reality, there were atrocities being conducted by everyone. This civil war appalled the regular army commanders. On the British side, there was Alexander Leslie and his counterpart on the American rebel side was Nathaniel Green. They were just appalled by this brutal fighting. You know, maybe I should go talk a little bit more about The Patriot, the Mel Gibson movie. Mel Gibson supposedly modeled his character after South Carolina militia General Francis Marion. But I think that if Marion saw what Mel Gibson did to the movie, he would be just simply aghast. Now, we know that Marion has the nickname the Swamp Fox, but he never really became famous until a 19th century fictional biography turned into a legend that he never really was. The author of that biography was the same guy who invented the myth of George Washington chopping down the cherry tree. In reality, unlike the Mel Gibson, Gibson character, Marion was this very careful, conservative fighter. He wasn't physically imposing. He certainly wasn't Mel Gibson handsome. And unlike the Mel Gibson character, Marion owned slaves, like most rebels and loyalists did in coastal South Carolina. It was kind of funny because Marion might have stayed in obscurity, but he had this accident. And the context for that was that in 1780, the rebels had to surrender 
surrender Charlestown to the British, and most of the leaders surrendered with them. But Marion wasn't there. It seems that shortly before the British had taken Charlestown, Marion was at this party, and Marion really was sort of a social loner. He didn't really like parties. He wasn't much of a drinker, and he wanted to leave. But instead of making a scene and leaving through the front door, he was on the second floor and said, to, hey, listen, no fuss. I'll just jump from the second floor of this house. And he jumped. He broke his leg, and he was off his plantation when the British took Charlestown. So his broken leg allowed him to fight another day. As in the South, tensions between American rebels, loyalists, British soldiers, and Native Americans in New York, Pennsylvania, and in other frontier regions ran high after Yorktown. David would like to know more about the Native American and Loyalist raids in New York's Mohawk Valley. Can we attribute these raids and the raids that took place in other regions to family feuds and political grudges? Well, I'm really glad that you asked the question because I grew up in the Mohawk River Valley and Schenectady, New York. And what I learned in writing the book was kind of a revelation to me. I had been taught in school, as we all were taught in school growing up in Schenectady, about the Great Schenectady Massacre in 1690. This was during a previous French and British War. So I knew that Schenectady was on the frontier in the 17th century. What I didn't know that Schenectady, it was still the frontier 80 years later during the revolution. Land-hungry settlers had long been stealing land from Indians or otherwise forcing Native Americans to leave their homeland. Most Indians, because of all this land thievery going on, most Indians sided with the British. The British had at least made efforts to contain the settlements and preserve Indian lands that they had sworn to preserve under numerous treaties with the Indian nations. It wasn't too surprising then that New York became a battleground between the rebels on one side and the Brits, the Loyalists, and Indians on the other. The last battle of many that occurred in the Mohawk Valley took place around the time of Yorktown. A a force of Indians and Loyalists led by a British major and a Loyalist captain invaded the Mohawk River Valley. The captain was really interesting, a Loyalist. He was a young lawyer from Albany, which is about 15 miles from Schenectady. His name was Walter Butler. And to the Whigs, the rebels, he was particularly notorious because he had allegedly led and participated in massacres of women and children. What we now know, as we've looked at the documentation, is that it's pretty likely that the massacres occurred simply because he lost control of his troops. There are also accounts that Butler tried to stop the killings. But in the propaganda of the 1780s, he was the devil incarnate to the American rebel side. Butler himself had some scores to settle because the Whigs had imprisoned his mother and other loyalist women for a couple of years. So he was not a happy camper and probably very glad to be leading this raid in the Mohawk Valley. It turned out to be an incredible success for the loyalists and British and Indians. They just destroyed property and crops as close away as 12 miles from Schenectady. They also escaped a militia force, but the rebel militia force stayed on their tail, and somewhere in the middle of the wilderness in upstate New York, Butler was killed while he was leading a rear guard fighting this militia force. When the news came that Butler had died, this news actually caused greater celebration in Schenectady and the Mohawk Valley than the news of Yorktown. You know, the Whigs in Albany were excited about Walter Butler's death, too. The records actually seem to indicate that the people of Albany lived in a bit of fear that Butler would attack them, especially after tavern keeper Richard Cartwright had helped Butler escape from the Albany jail earlier in the war. Right. Butler had originally been a prisoner from the Battle of Oriskany, where he started recruiting loyalist troops in in the wake of Oriskany and Saratoga. Not a smart thing to do, so he was captured and later escaped, as you said. Now that we've covered fighting in the southeast and in the northeast, let's go a bit farther west. Would you tell us about the fight for Arkansas Post? Arkansas Post, I might add, is now a National Historic Site. This 
site in Arkansas near the junction of the Arkansas River and the Mississippi River has just been an ancient and long trading site for Native Americans, for the Spanish who owned most of the Mississippi River Valley, for the British, for settlers. It was a trading center, and the Spanish built a fort there named after their king, Fort Juan Carlos. The Spanish entered the war reluctantly, and we can get into why they were fighting the British a little later on if you want, but this post in particular was being harassed by a force of uh, loyalists and Native Americans, Chickasaw Indians, along with escaped slaves who had joined this force and mixed race people. It was led by a guy named James Logan Colbert, and Colbert had married into the Chickasaw tribe, and I think that if the British had won the war, he would be as famous as the Swamp Fox Francis Marion. But, of course, Colbert ended up on the losing side. But in May 1783, Colbert attacked the Spanish fort Juan Carlos. The Spanish were able to turn him away, but not before Colbert captured Fort Second in Command. The Spanish chased Colbert all over Kingdom Come, but they never caught him. But at one skirmish later in that month in May, that turned out to be the last battle of the American Revolution that was fought in North America. America, a little skirmish in Arkansas between the Spanish and a mixed Indian loyalist force. Although we Americans love to think about the 13 colonies as the crown jewel of Great Britain's first empire, in fact, the 13 colonies were more like the small diamond studs around that crown jewel. Great Britain and other European countries cared more about their colonies in the Caribbean than they ever cared for those on mainland North and South America. So, Don, Let's talk about why France and Spain entered the British War. Would you tell us about the fighting that took place in the Caribbean between Great Britain, France, Spain, and the Netherlands? Well, as most of us know, the French entered the war against the British after it became clear that this rebellion in North America wasn't just a flash in the pan. The Battle of Saratoga is often called the turning point. That battle was in 1777 because it gave indication to the European powers that this rebellion wasn't going to be suppressed very easily. The French themselves had tons of scores to settle with the British, not the least of which is that they wanted to recover Canada, which they had lost in the previous war with the British, but they were especially interested in expanding their reach in the West Indies. Now, why was the West Indies, why was the Caribbean, why was that such an important? Well, the Caribbean was the source of the richest wealth on earth, sugar plantations. This is where the French made their money. It was a huge source of income for all of the European powers. So it was kind of inevitable that the focus of the war would turn to the Caribbean. The British really weren't in very good shape in the Caribbean. The French had taken nearly all their islands, and a French fleet was headed toward a rendezvous with the Spanish, where they intended to take Jamaica and literally drive the Brits out of the West Indies. But, you know, fate intervenes, and the British defeated the French fleet before the rendezvous. This was the Battle of the Saints. The Saints is a group of of islands there in the Caribbean. The victorious British admiral was a guy named George Rodney. Rodney was just this nasty man. He was so nasty, the British in London had sent his recall orders because he had not done a good job. And it was while the recall orders were en route that Rodney won this great victory against the French. Why did the British government recall Rodney, you ask? <laughs> well, Rodney had made himself persona non grata because of his conduct at the Dutch island of St. Eustatius, which everybody calls Stacia. Its nickname, by the way, is the Golden Rock. Why was it the Golden Rock? Well, it had no sugar. It was literally a rock, but it was the great trading center of the Caribbean, and sort of like Singapore or Hong Kong today. It was a haven for smuggling. This was where American ships would stop and get goods and arms, I might add, from France and Spain. The Dutch said, hey, 
We're neutral. We are going to trade with anyone and everyone. This drove the Brits absolutely nuts. So it was the British who declared war on Holland. And as soon as Rodney got the word that he was at war with Holland, he attacked station and he took the island without firing a shot. But he wasn't generous in victory. He treated the foreign nationals on station there very poorly. He confiscated private property and he singled out Jewish traders for persecution, including at least one Jewish trader who was a loyalist, a British loyalist who escaped from the colonies in North America and found refuge in Stacia among the Dutch. What really angered the British government was that Rodney was confiscating all this private property and keeping the money for himself. He was recalled, but by the time he arrived home, he was a national hero and uh, was forgiven. From mainland North America to the Caribbean, and now from the Caribbean to Europe, fighting between Great Britain, France, and Spain also took place in the Mediterranean Sea. Don, would you tell us about Gibraltar? How did it become a British possession? And what's up with Spain and Gibraltar? Spain seems obsessed with getting Gibraltar back from Great Britain. Well, Gibraltar is a peninsula that's part of the Spanish mainland. Its geography is really important because it controls part of the entrance to the Mediterranean from the Atlantic Ocean. The Spanish had lost Gibraltar to the British in an early 18th century war. And as soon as the Spanish had signed the peace treaty for that war, they had second thoughts. They had seller's remorse. And this has been a sticking point in Spanish-British relations, as, as you mentioned, to this very day. During the revolution, the Spanish thought, aha, if we enter the war and fight with the French, they can help us retake Gibraltar. And France desperately wanted Spain to enter the war because France knew it couldn't defeat the British without the Spanish fleet. Spain said, aha, we'll enter the war, but only if you agree that the war won't end until we take Gibraltar. The French agreed. There was a long siege there. It lasted several years, and it culminated in a clash of high-tech weapons. This is kind of fun. A French engineer came up with the idea of turning ships into floating gun batteries that were so heavily fortified that they wouldn't sink or burn. It was really an amazing technology. It included stuff like water pumps to keep the batteries from burning, walls of wet sand and cork, and the sides of these floating batteries were made of timber that were three feet thick. The, the French and the Spanish put these floating batteries into position, and they aimed the cannon at Gibraltar's most vulnerable positions that the British held. It was brilliant. It was great technology. The batteries fired away. They repelled the British cannon, and they didn't burn. It was a brilliant success for about a day. <laughs> then the British showed some high-tech weapons of their own. The British had figured out a way to heat cannonballs until they were red hot. Now, normally if you heat a cannonball, it'll explode, but they figured out a way to heat these cannonballs so they didn't explode. These red hot cannonballs that the British were firing eventually found themselves embedded into the sides of these floating batteries. They ignited the wood, and by the next morning, nothing was left of the floating batteries and the British had won a huge victory. It was just a terrible debacle for the French and the Spanish. And as we know, Gibraltar is British to this very day. From your book, it didn't seem like the Spanish or at least the Spanish general was too broken up over losing the battle because didn't the Spanish general embrace his British counterpart when the siege ended? When the British surrendered at Yorktown, the British second-in-command, Charles O'Hara, who actually surrendered the British army to Washington and the French, he had some wonderful dinners with the French and the American rebels. And it, it, this was a pretty common practice. Once you're defeated, you, um, you act generously, and the defeated enemy has dinner with the victorious general. The fighting of the American War for Independence wasn't confined by the Atlantic Ocean or Mediterranean Sea. Military aspects of this war extended all the way to Asia, where fighting took place in India. On July 7, 1778, Warren Hastings, the governor of British India, received word that France had entered the American War for Independence. Don, how did the American War for Independence manifest itself 
in India. This is kind of interesting, and it has some relevance to us today in our war of terrorism. The main opponent of the Brits in India was a native general from Mysore, the state of Mysore. His name was Hyder Ali, and he was a Muslim. He was so famous that American rebels named a naval ship after him, and that ship actually won a nice little victory in Delaware Bay. Hyder Ali believed in a meritocracy. He didn't care what religion you were as long as you performed. And of course, there were always tensions between Muslims and Hindus and Christians. He didn't care. I want performance, he said. And he was a brilliant general. He was an innovative general. And he also used high tech. He used these rockets that were bamboo and lined with iron, and they were quite effective. The French leadership in India was pretty uninspired until until a French naval commander showed up. His name was Pierre-André de Suffren, Suffren, as we might say in American English. His men, his crew, called him Admiral Satan because he was a tough guy. He was this gigantic, morbidly obese man, but absolutely brilliant. And he indeed might have kicked the Brits out of India if he had had proper support and if the war hadn't ended. But indeed, the last battle of the American Revolution was fought in India on June 25th, 1783. A French army had attacked British troops that were surrounding the city of Cuddalore, which is on the southeast coast of India. The attack was a spectacular failure, but before Suffren could add naval support for the French army, the word came that the peace treaty had been signed, the preliminary peace treaty had been signed, and all of a sudden there was a truce in India, but the last battle of the American American Revolution had been fought. Let's bring the war full circle and back to North America. Would you tell us about Guy Carlton's evacuation of North America? Was the British evacuation orderly? And how many loyalists and soldiers did Carlton evacuate from the United States? I think we need to put this into perspective. It took a year between the signing of the preliminary peace treaty and the final evacuation of the British from New York, which was their last major post in what had now become the United States. It was really quite an orderly evacuation, considering that Carleton, the British commander-in-chief, was dealing with 35,000 angry, absolutely bereft and persecuted American loyalists who had fled for safety and eventually evacuation in New York. And he also had 20,000 British soldiers he had to evacuate. Carleton and Washington actually met in person to discuss the details of evacuation and everything went well. They got along fine until Carleton sort of mentioned to Washington that he had already evacuated some African-American people who had escaped slavery from the Whigs. Washington just went ballistic that Carleton would dare to remove the property of citizens of the United States, slaves being property. This, according to Washington, was absolutely contrary to the peace treaty. Carleton replied, I have no right to deprive these former slaves of the liberty that I find them possessed of. And indeed, about 3,000 escaped slaves would eventually be evacuated from New York. This wasn't all hearts and flowers for the British. They also evacuated 1,500 slaves of their own, and they were not freed. All told, the British evacuated about 20,000 freed African Americans from North America, and many more escaped on their own. What about the Native Americans? Kyle would like to know what happened to the Native Americans who sided with the British during the War for Independence. Did the British protect their Native American allies, or did Great Britain's Native allies face reprisals from the Whig victors? I think it's fair to say that the war's biggest losers were Native Americans. Virtually all of the Indian nations had sided with the British, or they were forced from neutrality into siding with the British. When the Indians learned that the peace treaty left them on their own with these land-hungry and pretty usually racist Americans, they couldn't believe that their ally, the British, had abandoned them. One Mohawk chief said the abandonment was something only Christians were capable of doing. 
arguing to the South, a Creek chief said the betrayal was cruel and ungenerous. Even in Parliament, a member of Parliament said that the peace treaty the government signed was cruel and made of perfidy. It was just beyond the feeble of power of description to describe this betrayal, this member of Parliament said. The Prime Minister replied in one of the classic statements of hypocrisy. He said, the Indians weren't abandoned. They were left in the care of their neighbors. That didn't work out very well for the Native Americans. There were two Indian nations, the Oneidas and Tuscaroras in upstate New York, who had sided with the American rebels during the war. And even they ended up being mistreated. They were given land grants and swamps. Their veterans who fought with Washington's army, I might add, were denied pensions. They were pressured to sell their land. And in fact, the Oneidas kept protesting this bad treatment for 220 years. And it wasn't until three years ago, 2013, that the state of New York and the Oneida Nation finally signed a treaty that settled all of the Oneida's various claims. And after Yorktown, Don states that the American War for Independence ended on May 12, 1784. Don, what happened on May 12, 1784? Why did the war end on that day? Just to remind your listeners, Yorktown happened in October 1781. Two and a half years later, after months of fighting and negotiating and ratifying, the final signed treaties were actually exchanged. This happened at Ben Franklin's residence outside Paris. The exchange involved Franklin and his colleague, John Jay, who later became America's first chief justice, and the British rep on the other side, a guy named David Hart. He he was an opponent of the war, but his most famous claim to fame politically was that he was known as the most boring man in Parliament. One colleague once described Hartley, whenever Hartley stood up to speak, it was sort of like a dinner bell sounding, and, and the House of Commons would just quickly clear out so they didn't have to endure one of his long, boring speeches. But Hartley was honest, and he was competent, and he was a friend of Franklin, and he got it done. Don, it's already time for the Time Warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion... What might have happened if Cornwallis had not surrendered at Yorktown in October 1781? Would the war have played out any differently, given that so much fighting took place around the globe between 1781 and 1783? You know, it's an interesting question. I think it depends on the scenario. If Cornwallis had just been successfully evacuated, then I think the war would have dragged out longer. But as we know in our fighting in Vietnam and in the Middle East, it's really hard to fight an insurgency on foreign territory, on the insurgents' own land. A different scenario would have been if the British had decisively defeated the French fleet off the coast of Virginia, off the coast of Yorktown, what's called the Battle of the Capes. If so, a very different scenario might have happened. The Brits might have been able to make a much more aggressive stance in the Caribbean. They might have forced the French and Spanish out of the war. A lot of the French wealth came from the Caribbean. And if the British had been able to force the French out of the war, all bets are off. They might have returned to North America and they might have defeated the Americans who would have no source of arms or money or clothing. Are you working on a history book now? If so, what are you researching and writing about? I've actually started researching a history of American military intervention. Now, many historians have done bits and pieces of this. Some have looked at America's small wars, some have looked at individual wars, but I haven't found anyone who's really written a narrative about the whole thing from 1775 to uh, 2015 anyway. My biggest challenge in doing that, and I hope I can figure it out, is how do you organize something like that so it's not just a list so that you can actually read it as a narrative. And where is the best place to look for more information about you after Yorktown and how we can get in contact with you if we still have questions? 
go to my website, donglickstein.com. I think my website has some really fun stuff on it. It has a whole bunch of really nasty 18th century political cartoons. It has pictures of about 80% of the folks I talk about in the book. And most importantly for me as a former journalist, it has a list of about 10 mistakes I made, factual errors. Most of them were obvious and careless errors on my part. As a former journalist, newspapers run corrections. Historians are human beings. As our journalists, we make mistakes, and I think we need to be very open about our mistakes and not wait for a second edition of a book before you uh, run the corrections. Don Glickstein, thank you for revealing all of the fighting that took place in the American War for Independence after all the fighting supposedly finished at the Battle of Yorktown. Well, thank you. Wow. Our whirlwind tour has left our brains with a lot to think about. The last military action of the American War for Independence took place in India. And the war actually came to an end not in October 1781, but on May 12, 1784, with the exchange of the final and ratified version of the Treaty of Paris. These facts are not ones that most of us learned in school. Instead, we learned that the American War for Independence finished at the Battle of Yorktown in October 1781. And what our lessons omitted was the fact that fierce fighting carried on for an additional two years. And the fighting we missed out on didn't just take place in the United States. It took place around the globe. Battles took place in non-United States North American territories, in the Caribbean, at Gibraltar, and on the other side of the globe in India. Isn't it wild to think about the fact that the American War for Independence was a global event? We tend to learn the history of the United States in isolation from other events that took place around the world. But study of the historical record reveals that throughout its history, North America and the young United States were very much entwined with global events. Forces of nature, European, African, South American, and Asian politics, culture, and economics have all informed and influenced events that have taken place in North America and in the United States throughout their history. I hope this helps us realize that when we read about a historical event, we should ask ourselves, why and how did this event happen? And what else was going on in the world that might have helped shape this event? You will find more information about Don, his book, After Yorktown, plus notes from everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 081. If you enjoyed this episode and love the podcast, would you please consider helping to support it? There's a crowdfunding campaign for Ben Franklin's World where listeners like you help me cover the costs associated with producing this show. For more information about the campaign or to make a donation, text support BF World 233444 or visit benfranklinsworld.com slash movement. Finally, what aspect of the American War for Independence after Yorktown would you like to know more about? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.